Final authority, not sola scriptura. Um, one of the big arguments that the Roman Catholics have, they of course replace the sacred scriptures with their divine tradition. And they say, where in the Bible does it say only the Bible, only the scriptures? Well, I've made a video before about the scripture alone versus papal traditions. And it's fine to say the scriptures alone are my authority, but the little philosophical argumentation that the Catholics come up with, they'll say, but you read other books, don't you? So then it's not really scripture alone. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, obviously it's not scripture alone for me. Here's a book I've written. So, you know, some people would say, oh, you shouldn't have written a book. You're taking away from the authority of scripture. No, I'm actually teaching a doctrine that's in the scriptures with that book. That book has lots of scripture in it. But, um, it's not really a good argument, but for the sake of the argument, it's not really the scriptures alone that you have as a Christian. There's other sources and things. Okay, so what's the real argument? The real argument is the issue of final authority. All right, the scriptures are the final authority. I can use lots of other books all around me here. A lot of these are Bibles, of course, King James Bibles up here and here and things, but uh, there's commentaries, there's other books, there's things about the history of the Bible and doctrines and everything else. I have the Quran here and the um, Bukhari thing or whatever here. Uh, a couple of editions of the Quran. I have stuff from the Jews and things. There's all these different things of Islam up here somebody sent me. and I have a lot of different books, but my final authority is right here. King James Bible. And I'm going to show you from the scriptures. You say it's circular reasoning. No, it's the Bible saying that this is supposed to be your final authority here on earth. This one's inspired by God. Okay? All this other stuff isn't. This one is. Matthew chapter 7. See, the real debate here is not sola scriptura or whatever else that you want to get into and divine tradition and all the other stuff. It's what does the Bible say? What was given from Jesus Christ to his apostles? Did Jesus ever say, now, you know, I'm going to give you the sacred scriptures. And then later on, as time progresses, you can just kind of overthrow the sacred scriptures with your divine tradition. Uh, and the answer is very obviously no to that. Um, but is there a practice in the scriptures itself where the scriptures are given as a final authority? And the answer is very definitely yes. To that, so uh, don't get let these Catholics take you into that argument of where does the Bible say the Scripture alone? And there are some scriptures, by the way, that definitely talk about that. But that's not the real argument, because that's just a little intellectual trap, a philosophical trap that they will use to get you. But the Bible is your final authority. That's where you get a Catholic. Matthew chapter seven, verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine says. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. What is a scribe? A scribe is somebody who obviously writes. All right? They are the one that would be transmitting scripture and, and making books and writing. And what do the scribes do? You get a lost scribe. They constantly will put questions and doubts and debate and arguments um, into whatever text that they're talking about. Think of the uh, pagans there and the, and the Paul encounters there at uh, Mars Hill. And they're, they're sitting around there hearing, we would hear this new thing that you've come. You've set her forth with strange doctrines and whatever else. You know, Let, let's hear this. And they're sitting around, hmm, that was very interesting. But, you know, it reminds me of Plato and... And Aristotle and Socrates said in, in his, you know, third column of his work on such and such. And, uh, well, yes, but Julius Caesar, I believe he had some good points that he made as well. And, uh, they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you'll get the same thing with uh, Roman Catholics, the quote-unquote educated ones. They'll come out and they'll say, you know, well, I think that the thing we could say here would be that, you know, number... Uh, 1461, the, the minister of the sacrament. And, uh, well, yes, but I, I would have to think of uh, Aquinas when he said such and such. Yes, but uh, Polycarp said so and so, and uh, well, Tertullian said this. And, and it, you see, they don't speak as one that has authority. 
it's constantly just this philosophical thing of, well, that makes a good point, but then again, I could argue this, and, and, and it's, you're just left going, what are you even saying? <laughs> you know. But when the Lord spoke here on the earth, he spake as one having authority. Thus saith the Lord, is it not written this? It is written, it is written, it is written. Okay, um, I go and I get a vehicle. I want the title to that vehicle. I want it in writing. I want a bill of sale. I want the registration card and the insurance card and whatever else. It's my vehicle. Police officer pulls you over and he says, um, uh, license and registration, please. Well, that reminds me of what Socrates once said. In the <laughs> no, here's the paperwork. There, proof that I own this vehicle. I didn't steal it. I'm perfectly legally driving this thing. If I went a little bit over the speed limit, then I'm sorry about that. You see, that's authority, having authority. And it's authority to say the scriptures right here, not the changing doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. And the Catholics, they will try uh, to convince you that, oh, we've, the church, you know, you have your 40,000 Protestant denominations. It's such confusion. But the church of Christ stands strong and stands firm and and we, we're in agreement and whatever. No, they're not. There's been so many arguments and whatever else. They constantly have to have counsel of this and counsel of that to say this is the official position of the church. And there's priests that, oh, we don't agree and whatever. What about during the pandemic thing? There was a big argument within Catholicism about, you know, some of the shots uh, were had viruses that were cultured on aborted baby tissue. And certain Catholics said, hey, you know, Abortion's a mortal sin. I think getting it injected into your body would probably qualify you for some bad stuff to happen. And the Vatican made an official statement saying, yes, but you know, to if you have to take a life to save a life, well, then it's okay. And I did a video on it. Of course, it's been taken down from YouTube. They can't handle that kind of truth coming out. But abortion's a mortal sin unless, so you get into something. No, abortion's a sin all the time. It's never right to take a baby's life. And it's a baby. A woman is with child. She's not pregnant. There's no such thing in the scriptures. You see, I have a final authority. So what you say, well, modern science is, I don't care about your modern science. If it doesn't line up with this book, I reject it. And real science doesn't uh, contradict the scriptures, by the way. Philosophical little evolutionary things and nonsense like that, that contradicts the scriptures because it was made up by a bunch of atheists looking for a way to get out of judgment. Another issue. Second Timothy chapter three. We'll go there next. See about this thing of final authority. Second Timothy. I mean, it just it should be logical too. That's the thing that blows my mind. Uh, well, you know, we can debate this thing back and forth. Why? Why can't the scriptures be our final authority? You know, I mean, there's liberty in the scriptures. Um, I don't say that, you know, hey, somebody wants to meet in a building or something and say, let's come and all the church be gathered together and decide this big building or whatever. Okay, fine. But uh, you really don't have any scripture to say it's a church and it's a local church and all the other. The church is the people. But, you know, you want to meet in some place with a bunch of other believers. Well, fine. That's great. I don't have a problem with that. Um, there's liberty there. Not a big deal. You don't have, well, the Christians meet in houses, so they have to meet in houses all the time. You cannot meet in anything but a house because house is, is the only thing it's mentioned that they met in. Well, they also met in public places as well. So houses are public places. That's the only thing we're allowed to do in Scripture. No, I've never taught that. Okay, people try to say that about me. It's not true. Denninger teaches you have to have a house church. No, I don't. <laughs> But, you know, if you then start to overthrow the scriptures with your traditions of men and start to say that you're not right with God if you don't come to church, if you're not part of a local church, you're not faithful to your local church, yeah, then you're starting to get into trouble. But let's look at another passage here that talks about the thing of the scriptures being our final authority. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scripture, not tradition is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All right? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Oh, that's why the Vatican versions have to change that 
term right there, throughly furnished unto all good works. All right, they'll change the, the scriptures around and things because this right here shows final authority. The scriptures are what you need for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness. Why? So that you can be perfect, throughly furnished unto all good works. You don't need traditions. You don't need to say, well, yeah, the Bible's good, but the new St. Joseph's Baltimore Catechism or the new Lutheran uh, confession of faith, Baptist uh, catechism, and whatever, and there is a Baptist catechism, I have it, uh, all these different things. The Methodist Book of Discipline, we need that to tell us how to live. That's not what the Bible says right there. The scripture is given for uh, re doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. If it's in here, then you can, you do it. Unless it's a liberty thing, you can make up your mind one way or the other what you eat. If you want to celebrate holidays, if women should wear head coverings or not, those are three areas of liberty that Christians have. You can agree to disagree and go your own way on that. Fine, not a problem. But you never go beyond this when it comes to the thing of instruction and righteousness. And the problem, like I said, if the catechism, the Roman Catholic catechism, and I have lots of them, I have, you know, just to tell you if out there, if you're a Catholic, uh, I'm not ignorant. Oh, he's some rad, just radical, nut, heretic, you know, Baptist. I'm not a Baptist. But he's one of these heretics or whatever else. It's, he's just ignorantly speaking against Catholicism. No, uh, I have this catechism. I have the older catechism right there. I have the church teaches, documents of the church in English translation by Jesuit fathers of St. Mary's College. I have that. I've showed that in m numerous studies. I have the Canons and Decrees of the Council of Trent. I have three editions of the... I don't want that touching my Bible. Um, I have the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism right there. I have the another one, New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism, uh, First Communion Catechism right there. I have the... Uh, Second Vatican Council, right there. Um, trying to see here. I know I have another Catholic picture dictionary. Uh, Luther's small catechism. And uh, de Harbe's catechism, a complete catechism of the Catholic religion from the German of Joseph de Harbe S.J., Jesuit Catechism. So I have all these Catholic books right here. You know, I'm not ignorant. And I read this stuff, right? Very important. Um, that's how important it is. And you know what? I'd have no problem with this stuff down here on the floor. I'd have no problem with that if it lined up here. But that stuff contradicts this book. That's why I don't, I don't want to go and read about, well, Aquinas said this and Athanasius said this and, and whatever. I don't need to read about that stuff. I read what the scriptures say. And I want the most accurate Bible translation ever made into my language of English. And that is the King James Bible, the authorized version. Right here. I speak as one having authority. I don't want to be one of these little hirelings that stands here and says, now, what we read there in the text, that's very good, but a better translation would be, why would you call a book God's word if you believe it could be translated better? See, again, it's just logical to me. If I'm going to call this King James Bible God's word, then it has to be perfect and without error. Otherwise, God makes mistakes. Just simple when you're honest. Romans chapter 3. But, you know, then I don't really look as intelligent as some people do, I guess, because I, you know, actually hold up a book as the final authority and I don't promote myself. Romans chapter 3, verse 1, down through verse 18. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. The written scriptures were committed to the Jewish people. This is a Jewish book. It's not a Gentile book. Hmm. Interesting, because the Old Testament was in Hebrew for the Jews. The New Testament was Greek, inspired originally in Greek. 
hmm, when God says, okay, the Jews, you can still understand this Greek language here, but I'm also going to go to the Gentiles now. Very interesting. Verse 3, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written. Is this the inspired word of God? Yes. Then let God be true, and every man, if I make mistakes, and there's a few in there I need to correct, every man a liar. Oh, brother, you know, let me tell you about my book here that I've written. This book is greater than the Bible could ever hope to be. No, 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 no. Written by a fallible man. Written by an infallible God. God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. I can overcome any of you out there when you try to judge me based on your feelings because I can go right to the scriptures. Well, I just think you have some pride. I just think that you're this and you're, you're mean-spirited. You shouldn't say it. Let, let me show you what the scriptures say. If you want to rebuke me in the comments, I don't care about your feelings or about what you have, your little things that you need. Show me from the scriptures that I'm wrong. And if you if you prove me right, or excuse me, if you prove me wrong and you're right, I will openly say, talk about it. I've done that numerous times. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I said that wrong or whatever else. I submit to this book. I plainly do. Not to a false interpretation of the book. You see, lost people don't understand this book. So don't some, come and try to take words out of context or whatever else. Now this... I saw somebody in the comments the other day, some guy said, well, the book of Job, the, you know, Job, the Bible, the King James Bible is so badly translated. It says that Job says, I am a tambourine. No, actually, I went to the passage and it says, I am as a tabret. <laughs> Didn't even say tambourine. So I just said, you're a liar. And I quoted the scripture, copied and pasted it, stuck it into the comment. You're a liar. It doesn't say I am a tambourine. He says, I am as a tabret, as a tabret. Not that he is one. Scripture, final authority, you understand? Verse 5, But if our unrighteousness commend the righteous, righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth, John 17, 17. For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? People will call you a liar that by evil report, you know, and things because you quote the scriptures. And Paul's being a little bit sarcastic there. If the truth of God hath abounded through my life unto his glory, uh, through my lie unto his glory, in other words, if I'm lying to you and yet it's going to glory, glorify God, I'm not actually the one lying, you are. We'll see that here. Verse 8, and not rather as we be slanderously reported. Are there slanderous reports about me online? A few. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of them. Libel and slander. You know, if I felt like going to court with people, I could take a lot of people to court and sue them badly because they have openly, you know, done libel and slander against me. It's ridiculous. I've been accused of uh, looking at child pornography and things on this Rational Wiki website. They had that out a while back. I never looked at child pornography a day in my life. That's libel. That's slander. I could take legal action against them said a whole bunch of other stuff, just terrible things about myself and my wife. Slanderously reported, and it will happen to you too. So don't just, oh, it's Brother Brian, you know, he's too caustic, and that's why he gets attacked. You can be as nice as you want to be, and people will still lie about you. Am I right? Put it down in the comments. It's a good thing to tell stories about what you go through because it strengthens other brethren. They see, hey, other people are going through the same thing. And you'll see people that once were friends and they will lie about you, stab you in the back like you can't believe. But uh, verse 8, continuing here, it says, And not rather as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, Let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. You know when people start to lie about you when you're doing right, and you start to suffer, suffer for well-doing? Their damnation comes as a result of that. God takes that seriously. 
And we don't have to look and go, oh, I'm so sorry to see that. Oh, they went to hell. Oh, it's terrible. Their damnation is just. Verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Yeah, Jews and Gentiles were all under sin. Just because you're Jewish and the oracles of God are committed to you, it doesn't make you better than a Gentile. You're still a sinner. Verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no peace to the wicked, saith my God. The Bible talks about that. And yet these people think that they can come along and try to wreck your faith in this King James Bible. And the arguments that people come up with. Oh, King James was a Freemason. Well, um, there was a conspiracy there where uh, William Shakespeare and Edward de Vere and, and uh, Francis Bacon and, and all the, you know. And they come out with all this different stuff. Like, you know, those guys actually wrote the Bible and they didn't. Okay, there were 54 translators when the Bible translation began in 1604, the, the work. By the time it was over, it was about 47 men because it took seven years. Some dropped out. Some, I think, a few of them passed away. So... There were, there were three different translation committees, Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster. Okay, they went over every single verse and went and got everything just correct. And then from 1611 to 1769, they went through and they corrected spelling things and they changed the font a little bit. Um, that's what they did. So our King James Bible today uh, is very good. You don't have to worry about it. All right. Um, now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll see some more verses about final authority. You say, what? I don't understand that Romans chapter 3, what was that about the final authority thing? Well, very simple. Uh, man is corrupt. The arm of flesh will fail you. you. You dare not trust your own. Like the old hymn says, you know, stand up for Jesus. Um, you can't trust men. So the catechism comes along and all these different guys, and it's not just Catholicism, the, any Protestant denomination as well. They come out and they say, well, we have these special things and these special whatever. And, and you look and you say, uh, could you please give me the book, chapter, and verse where that particular thing appears? Oh, wow, well, you know, it might not be specifically written out in there, but, you know, it's, it's close enough and things. And you think, well, actually, if I do what you're telling me to do, then that would actually make me contradict what the scriptures say to do. So, hmm, you know, am I going to go with one of the unrighteous people out there, a sinner? Or will I stick with the perfect word of God? See, final authority. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Um, let's read this chapter here. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom. Can you say amen to this ministry? Yes. <laughs> a lot of times I don't have excellency of speech. I don't go back through and cut. And anytime I make a mistake, I cut it out because I don't want to look stupid please. Declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. How many times I have written or people have written to me and they say, I was just praying about this. Lord, I don't understand this passage of scripture. And I get this in my head and it's, hey, why don't you preach on this subject? Okay, I'll do that. And I come out and I preach about it. Somebody says, I was just studying this. I was just praying about this. Wow. I mean, it's happened so many times. Why? Fellowship of the Spirit. You see, that's something the Roman Catholics don't understand. They have no fellowship of the Spirit. They have to fake the Holy Spirit. All right. They don't understand what it's like to be born again, to receive the Holy Spirit of God. So they say, well... How do we come up with the right interpretation? You say you're right, and this person says that they're right, and whatever else. Well, the Holy Spirit guides into all truth. Oh, that's preposterous. It has to be the magisterium. It has to be the special uh, people and whatever. What if they're wrong? Well, then we'll have church councils that can correct them later on. <laughs> no, it doesn't work that way. 
You don't understand. You're not saved. Um, and why is it supposed to be this way, by the way? Why should it be about the Holy Spirit and not with preachers that are great orators and everything? Why should it be that way? Verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You get it? Your faith shouldn't stand in the wisdom of men. Don't you ever come up with a denomination called Denlingerism or Denlingerite or something like that. I hope and pray, I, I will say this in the future, if I pass away before the catching up of the body of Christ and a bunch of you idiots out there come up with some kind of thing and call yourselves the Denlingerites or whatever, I hope the Lord just destroys your system. And if you have a church building with my picture on it or something, I hope he burns it down, strikes it with lightning and it just burns it right to the ground. <laughs> Don't you dare make me into some kind of a God or whatever, the founder of the Denlingerite faith or something. Gag me. Um... Verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. Huh. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is, orally spoken, passed down through traditions through the century. Uh, new as, as as it is spoken in the universities and the seminaries to the the, the clergy clergy I almost said laity laity that'd be terrible as it's spoken by the magisterium as it's spoken by uh, the holy father from Saint Peter's chair you know no but as it is written the final authority. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know, the Bible tells us a little bit about heaven, especially back in the book of Revelation, but there's a lot of things we don't know. And you even see John, he's back there in the book of Revelation, and he hears seven thunders uttering their voices, and he, ooh, he starts to write, and, and the Lord says, no, don't write that. See, thou write it not. Seal up those things. No, don't write that. But if we have traditions of men, well, the Bible's ignorant about this, but I can just kind of fill in some details here and there. And I'll just say, according to tradition, you know, they have these Hollywood movies, stupid, wicked movies coming out, sometimes by the Catholics. And they, they come out and they say, we're going to talk about, we have this movie of the early years of Jesus. Where's the scripture for that? Where's the talk about the early years of Jesus? We have the story of him, you know, talking to the doctors of law and everything else in the synagogue and his, you know, mother and Joseph, they go away and then they come back and there's that. But that's pretty much all you read about Jesus' childhood. You don't read a whole lot of other things. Oh, but we're going to come up with a movie. Based on what? What's your final authority for that? Well, that's right. The wisdom of men that comes to naught. Shouldn't be that way. Verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Okay, stop there again. Um, you have to accept the catechism. The catechism is the right thing. I'll grab this one off the floor. Um, the, the catechism, divine tradition, sacred scripture. They're so good together. Okay, I will compare the things of the Holy Spirit here, the things that the Spirit teaches, with this book over here. And I say, okay, hmm, yeah, uh, celibate priests, celibate priests, no celibate priests. Hmm. Okay, the, uh, that doesn't work. Um, purgatory in here. Where's purgatory at in there? It's not there. Failed again. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's why I reject this book. This book is just no good. This book is God's word. This is my final authority. 
You see? But if I can pick up something and read it and say, you know, there was one of the popes, I, forget, I always forget which one it was, but he said, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Yeah, I would agree with that. Hey, good job, Pope, whatever your name was. Very good. I agree. You agree with the Pope? When he lines up with scripture, yes, I do. Absolutely. Good. You know, even a broken clock is right twice a day. But, uh, Verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's why lost Catholics don't understand what I'm saying. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. All right? I am part of the body of Christ. So the mind of Christ is the Spirit of God, which we read about earlier up there, verses 12 and 13 there, which reads about that. I have the Spirit of Christ within me. I have the mind of Christ. I can understand things like He can, but I still have to judge things according to the Word of God. I can judge all things out there. Why? Because I have a final authority in this, in the Scriptures, the Scriptures right here. And you say, well, the Scriptures alone. Well, the Scriptures are there as the final authority. But if I have a book that teaches something that's in the Bible, clearly written, if there's commentaries here, if there's other books down in here that make some really good points, if there's things down there in that pile in the catechism that are correct and true, then I can say, hey, it lines up with the scriptures. Good job. See? So is it really right to say sola scriptura? Well, not really. I mean, I understand the arguments there and the debating back and forth. I get it that, you you know, they're trying to say we reject all the extra biblical stuff. But then you have Luther writes his own catechism. So reforming the, you know, satanic church of Catholicism, well, that's not right. And then the Baptists come out and they do it. And the Methodists come out and they do it. And all these different things. We have our, we have the Bible and our catechism, the Bible and our church discipline books and all the other stuff. You don't need it. You do not need it. This is your final authority right here. But you can read whatever else, and if it lines up with the book, then good. All right. Uh, 1 John chapter 5. You know, Paul was a very open-minded man when you get right down to it. He's going and he's talking with people and debating with people and whatever else. And when I say debate, I don't mean, you know, sinful debating of, you know, arguing and things with somebody where you're wasting your time you realize they're never going to change and you just want to try to trap them intellectually so that you look superior that's not that's just fleshly carnal stuff when i say debating i mean the one passage of scripture says about debate thy calls with thy neighbor you know where you're actually going and you're saying well can i show you what the bible says and you're a nice peaceful rational thing um there's not many actual organized debates that do that and that's why i stay away from debates i've had multiple you know, things, could you, would you want to debate? I actually had a guy trying to set up a debate between me and James White. Uh, yeah, okay. A guy that makes his living trying to undermine the authority of the scriptures. Why would I waste my time on somebody like that in terms of getting into some kind of an organized debate? But, you know, could you debate this pastor here? Could you please, I'm a pastor. I would like to debate you, debate you. I'm an evangelist. Please debate me. And uh, can we try to set up a debate between you and Kent Hovind on the rapture issue and all this other stuff. You know what I've said. You know what I preach and what I teach from the scriptures. And you know what the other guy teaches. Watch them both. Pray about it. Read the scriptures. Search the scriptures for yourself. And the Lord will reveal who's right. All right. 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 through 13. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit will show you what the Word is all about. Okay, let's see about that. Verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Word, capital Word being the manifest, of, you know, Jesus Christ manifest in the flesh, God manifest in the flesh. That's what it's ta talking about there. Seven references in your King James Bible to capital W Word, the manifest Word. Uh, and the NIV takes out this one here in 1 John 5, 7, the Johannine comma, they call it. Um, 
interesting, they take seven, the number of God, down to six, the number of man. Just coincidental, I'm sure. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. All right. There are three parts to God, body, soul, spirit, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and those three are one. There's one being, there's one person. The Bible never teaches anything other than that, that there's three separate persons. The Bible never says that. At least the King James Bible. I can't speak for the Vatican versions, but that's what that book is about. If you don't know, the Godhead Doctrine is what three times in the King James Bible it says Godhead, and that's what it's talking about. It puts all the scriptures together showing that there's no Trinity. It's called the Godhead. Very important study, which I won't get into here. Um, verse 8, 1 John 5, 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. All right. And if you study it, the spirit is obviously the Holy Spirit. And the water is a reference to cleanse them with the washing of the water by the word. Um, the Bible talks about that. And the blood, Jesus talks about the blood of the New Testament. All right. You go back to... Um, John chapter 6, and it talks about eating my flesh and drinking my blood. The flesh is the Old Testament. Blood is the New Testament. Um, very deep study. Again, lost people have no idea about that stuff. It's something that you have to be saved and born again to understand it. And there's a lot of scriptures that tie in to the whole thing. I went through it in my King Jesus Version videos if you want to watch that. But these three agree in one. You see? So the Holy Spirit will agree with the Bible. The water and the blood. Water and blood in the scriptures, it's in that passage right there, verse 8, it's talking about the written word of God. I will prove it as we continue. Um, how do you, so then how could you say that there's, this is an authority, but then there's other authorities? No. There are three that bear record in uh, heaven. Then there are three that bear witness in earth. You see? So God is in heaven. What are we left with on the earth? Well, the scriptures plus divine tradition. No, we're left with the scriptures, the water and the blood of the King Jesus Version and the Holy Spirit to guide you into it. Not the magisterium, not the holy, uh, most reverend doctor, professor, you know, whatever, THD, THM, PhD, all that other stuff. No, the Holy Spirit and the word of God. Verse 9, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For the wit this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, the Holy Spirit, in other words. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. What's the record? Scripture. Not div divine tradition down there. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Written. Ye may know. What is that? I have a final authority. Hey, there's an appointment, Brother Brian. You have to be at uh, such and such place. Really? Is it? How'd you hear about that? Oh, don't worry about it. I just know. I need to see. Is there a paper? That, there's a letter that came for me in the mail. And it says, um, Dear Mr. Denlinger, you need to be able to uh, show up at such and such date. It's a subpoena to court or something. Uh, you have to show up on such and such a date. Please call to confirm that you'll be there. And I call and I confirm and I say, okay, so everything's set and whatever else. Could you send me an email? I want this thing confirmed totally. I want to know that I have a final authority in writing and in word and the whole thing. I want to know. I better say that again. I want to know that I have something in written form that I can rely on as my final authority. I mean, what do you do if you're a Roman Catholic? Hey, the Mass, you have to be there. The, the more you can do the Eucharist thing, the better off you're going to be. And all of a sudden, oh, there's a uh, interdict. And they're saying the churches are, have to be shut down. Well, what do I do about the Mass? 
how am I supposed to get there? A lot of Catholics had their faith seriously shaken to see their holy church just set aside all the things that they're supposed to do to maintain that state of grace, and it was just set aside because of a political agenda. You say, no, that was a, it was a serious health crisis that went, we went through in the last three years. It was very serious. It was a pandemic. Oh, man. Oh, it was terrible. Can't God heal? Isn't God able to heal you? Why'd you have to shut everything down? Well, Protestants did it too. Yeah, they're just as corrupt. My faith wasn't shut down. I still worship the Lord because I did it at home. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, you know, like they did in the New Testament. And there were, you know, people out there, groups out there that just went ahead and worshiped and met together and whatever else. Good for you. Something coming out, oh, you can't do this and you can't do that. Uh, no, you don't have the right to say that. You know why? Because certain people have final authority and others don't. Um, and it doesn't come from man. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified. Why would you glorify something if it's got mistakes and errors in it? Kind of weird. It's not my, really my final authority. The Greek and the Hebrew is in the, you know, the traditions of the church. Uh, okay, do you glorify that? Even as it is with you. And, that ye, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Huh. So you, you can be uh, commanded by the word of the Lord? Mm-hmm. And the Lord can establish you? Yeah. Because you have a final authority. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15. The scripture says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all tradition. Oh, it doesn't say that. I'm sorry. With all authority, let no man despise thee. It doesn't mean that nobody will despise you. Lots of people will despise you when you hold this book as your final authority. All it means is let no man despise thee. Don't stop because people are angry at you. Just whatever. You can say whatever you want there. Rebuke with all authority. How do you do that if this is not a perfect book? How was Jesus able to speak? It is written. It is written if he had no perfect scriptures in his day. Well, that was Jesus. We don't have to do the same thing. We can't do the same thing because Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, but we just, we're just, you know, fallible uh, men and you know, uh, we have copyist errors in our Bibles and all translations or, you know, non, no translation can be inspired. And in then you can't follow the scriptures. Rebuke with all authority. No, brethren, we're supposed to have final authority in the scriptures, not in the writings of men. We keep saying that. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Hmm. 
Milk of the word, not traditions. All that came, came later, I forget. I forget myself sometimes, you know, yeah. They just uh, eventually said, oh, we'll just come up with our own traditions to overthrow the scriptures. And, you know, the scriptures become null and void because we have man-made traditions now. Progressive revelation or something. You know, we just constantly have new truths revealed to us. No. Second Peter chapter 1. The Bible does become more clear as time goes by because we get closer to the end times that the Bible warns about. And so we can see the things that are prophesied coming to pass. Um, but we don't have progressive revelation where it undoes certain parts of the Bible. And the satanic little imp at the World Economic Forum that comes out and says, we need to use artificial intelligence to translate the Bible more accurately. Okay, um, wouldn't it still be trans or, you know, changed by a man uh, who made the artificial intelligence, who programmed the artificial intelligence computer? <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 21. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Sorry there, Magisterium. Bye-bye. Sorry, uh, Board of Elders and whatever else. Trustees and deacons and... Uh, no. No. We have a special Baptist confession of faith. We have a special Lutheran, you know, the Missouri Synod and all this other. I'm the vicar here, you know. So no private interpretation. Verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You can still speak and be moved by the Holy Ghost, but your words are going to be judged by this book. Because if what you say is contrary to the Bible, then it's not the Holy Ghost speaking through you. And we can judge that and judge it perfectly. So, um, do we have a... Should we be standing for Sola Scriptura? Eh, I understand the argument there, but uh, it's not strong enough. Uh, let's stop saying the Bible alone, the Scriptures alone. No, actually, it's uh, the Scriptures are our final authority. And many of us have already been saying that. I'm not really telling it. A lot of you as Bible believers, it's, you'd say, well, yeah, I've already been saying this. I get it. But when you're arguing with Catholics, they come up with all these little philosophical little things that you have to you know, look out for, little traps that they try to get you into um, because they're lost. They don't understand the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto them. Neither can they know them because they're spiritually discerned, which we read earlier. Um, but... Don't fall for those traps. Um, yes, we do have a final authority. You speak English, right there it is. King James Version. The greatest Bible that's ever showed up. And again, if you're watching these videos and you say, well, you know, I, I know that you like the King James, but there's issues with it. No, there aren't. No, there aren't. No, there aren't. Um, you're very ignorant. You're believing the likes of John MacArthur, or James White, or some of these other devils that come out and they're scribes. They constantly will question the Word of God in their books, in their writings, and they'll talk about the Greek word here. It could also be translated in the, the shades and the nuances of the Greek and all this other... Uh, no. They're scribes. You don't listen to them. Um, this book has been tried and tested and proved more than any Bible in history. And this remains the greatest book that ever showed up on the earth. Period. That's not up to me. To That's just your opinion. No, it's not. Uh, no other book has been printed and published and passed out and preached out of, uh, not just in America, but all over the face of the earth, just the whole way around the planet, um, people have taken this book. And uh, you reject that, well, I don't know what to say for you, um, but this is the final authority at this ministry, and if you enjoy that, you agree, well, then you'll learn some things. And you'll see that the final authority is the King James Bible, not Brian Denlinger. And um, it'll be a blessing to you. But if you don't agree with that and you say, well, I want to go with the writings and teachings of men, well, okay, have fun with that. Let me know how that works out for you. I know how it will work out, but you're too proud to understand that or agree to it, so whatever. But uh, just telling it like it is. Um, Again, if you're using a new version, please look into that whole situation, the new versions. 
came about as a critical text uh, theory that came out in the late 1800s by two lost philosophers, um, Brooke Foss Westcott and Fenton John Anthony Hort. They came and said that we want to just do a few revisions to the King James Bible, and they introduced an entirely new Greek text based on a very small minority of manuscripts that were put out by the Vatican. That's why I call the New Versions Vatican Versions. And they introduced a new Bible, the Revised Version of 1881, later became the Revised, or the American Standard Version of 1901, and then 200 new versions were produced over the next 100 years, each one claiming to be an updating, and this is it now, we have it right, this is the final one, we, we you know, the, the King James Bible was good, and then we had to do this, and, that, and now we have, this one will be the best one, it's the most readable, most accurate. Uh, and they've just been lying and lying and lying. Why do you need to update the Bible 200 times in 100 years? That's nonsense. It was a scam. So if you have anything but an, a King, King James Bible, as an English-speaking Christian, you have a false version. And there's plenty of errors in those that date back before the King James Version showed up to the 1610 Dewey Reims, which I have down there. Um, proven. And... Um, the newer Dewey Reams, the Challoner revision that was done in the 1800s, uh, they actually updated it to make it read more like the King James Bible. Shows you who the, has the real authority. But you go back to the 1610 one, there's some really nutty stuff in that one. But uh, the whole point is the new versions, oh, we had to correct Acts 837 and we had to correct Mark 9, 44 and 46. And, you know, we had to say being saved in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 instead of are saved like the King James Bible. And we had to say, I bow my knees to the Father and take out of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, you go back to, to 1610, it was there before the King James Bible was written. So, oh, we found newer updated readings. No, they didn't. No, they did not. The new versions are just an attempt by the Vatican to undermine the authority of the King James Bible because this is a spiritual book. And if they can hand you a book with evil devil spirits in it, which the new versions have, um, then they take away your power. So don't fall for the new versions, please. Study the issue. Uh, there's plenty of videos on my channel here at my website, kingjamesvideoministries.com. Uh, I also have a lot of videos on the Bible version issue. So... That is going to be it for this study. I do hope it's been a challenge. Um, if you're a Roman Catholic out there, I just proved you wrong. Your whole theory there of uh, your traditions are just as good. No, they're not. No, they're not. Um, let God be true, but every man a liar, as saith the scriptures. That's going to be it. See you in the next video. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.